It's the weekend of Saturday, July 1st, Sunday, July 2nd. You are listening to Inception Radio Network, voice of the fringe majority. This is Carol Carl with Off the Beaten Path for the UFO Headline News. Not everything stops for the weekend. The sky, the stars and planets keep right on going. EarthSky.org does too. And they bring us this. Tonight, July 1st, 2017, as the setting sun closes the curtains on the day and the darkening skies bring out a myriad of far-off suns, let the moon introduce you to a very special star. The nearby bright star to tonight's moon and the planet Jupiter is none other than, drumroll please, Spica, the sole first magnitude star in the constellation Virgo the Maiden. The much brighter object in the vicinity of tonight's moon and Spica, well, giant planet Jupiter. Jupiter, the fifth planet outward from the sun, will remain in front of the constellation Virgo till mid-November this year. For a convenient measuring stick, how about this? The moon's diameter approximates one half degree of sky, and your fist at arm's length spans about ten degrees on the sky's dome. And another reference, Jupiter shines to the west of Spica, or conversely, putting the star first, Spica resides to the east of Jupiter. In a few to several more days, in fact, the moon will be farther east of Spica on the sky's dome and closer to the star Antares and the planet Saturn. Now, when that happens, you can use the dazzling planet Jupiter as your guide star to Spica. It's a planet, of course. Or next year, 2018, when Jupiter is no longer close to Spica, you might find it helpful to do that star hop kind of dance to Spica instead. And you can find a chart that shows you exactly the steps to that dance later at ufoheadlinenews.com. If you live in the Northern Hemisphere and you're familiar with the Big Dipper, you can count on this famous pattern of stars to guide you to Spica. Simply extend that Big Dipper handle to arc to the brilliant yellow-orange star Arcturus and then spike to Spica, as that old saying goes. Spica is a blue-white gem of a star. Bruce McClure notes that if we've got difficulty discerning star color with our eyes alone, binoculars are a handy helper. Here's the bottom line. Let the moon guide you to Spica on July 1st, 2017, and then use the Big Dipper to locate Virgo's brightest star after the moon's flirtation with Spica ends. As the name implies, off the beaten path here at UFO Headline News is that we're going to take some steps in some different directions. Here's a tasty morsel to begin with. It gets a byline for Calla Cofield, who writes it for Space.com. Headline, Chicken Sandwich Takes One Giant Leap for Food Kind. In what appears to be a historic first, a fast food chicken sandwich was successfully carried to the edge of space yesterday aboard a high altitude balloon. The Kentucky Fried Zinger sandwich journeyed skyward aboard a Worldview Enterprises Stratolite balloon vehicle at 9.11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. They took off out of Page, Arizona. There was a live webcast, and it cut out before liftoff, but a representative for Worldview confirmed the launch was successful, and KFC later released a video of the balloon taking off. The dialogue went something like this, quote, Holy cow, that's some spicy crispy chicken moving out at an average rate of 1,000 feet per minute. That's 304 meters per minute. End quotes. Those were the words of the official announcer in the KFC video. That's what he said as the balloon lofted skyward. He continued, quote, The Zinger should arrive at target altitude in about one hour and 20 minutes, where the Zinger mission will officially begin. End quotes. The sandwich is scheduled to remain aloft for four days and maintain an altitude of about 50,000 to 80,000 feet, which translates to 15,200 to 24,400 meters. During the flight, which is serving as an advertising campaign, but of course, for Kentucky Fried Chicken, the company will execute various activities to engage the public over social media. They're going to drop coupons, and which a coupon literally is going to drop from the balloon down to earth. Quote, The team on the ground here is justifiably celebrating as they watch their months of hard work pay off. End quotes. That's the announcer again. Oh, but wait, there's more. 
The announcer continued, quote, This is the greatest achievement in chicken sandwich space travel history. In all my years in this business, I've certainly never seen anything like it. What a time to be alive. End quote. The Zinger 1 mission will serve as a test flight for Worldview. That company aims to make stratospheric balloons, which can remain in flight for months at a time. The flight is scheduled to be the first, quote, extended duration development flight of Worldview's high-altitude Stratolite vehicle. And Worldview is spelling that S-T-R-A-T-O-L-L-I-T-E. That's according to the company's statement. The Worldview high-altitude balloons are designed to operate in a region of the atmosphere that's too high for most commercial airliners, but too low for satellites. The Stratolite vehicle is expected to be able to reach an altitude of up to 28.5 miles. That's 150,000 feet, or 45.8 kilometers. That means they would remain below something called the Carmen Line. That's Carmen with a K. It's 62 miles, 100 kilometers above the Earth. This line, the Carmen Line, is considered the boundary of space. The company, Worldview, said it has plans to use these balloons for scientific endeavors, such as Earth imaging, weather monitoring, and even astronomical observations. In addition, Worldview has announced plans to make balloons that can carry humans into the stratosphere as part of scientific missions for near-space tourism. While neither Kentucky Fried Chicken nor Worldview has said exactly how much KFC paid for the flight, Worldview representatives said the advertising campaign covered most of the cost of the test flight. The launch originally had been scheduled for June 21st, but was delayed due to weather. Oh, a lofty fast food chicken sandwich. Farewell, little chicken sandwich. We're sure you're packed with enough chemical preservatives so that a loft for four days is no challenge for you. But seriously speaking, gentle listeners, here's a headline. Stephen Hawking. Humans should ride a beam of light to other planets. Tia Goes writes this for Live Science. Humanity should focus its effort on exploring other worlds that we might inhabit, and to get there... Earthlings may need to ride on a beam of light. Those are the words of famed scientist Stephen Hawking. Hawking made his remarks on June 20th at Starmus, spelled S-T-A-R-M-U-S. That's an arts and science festival in Norway. He sits on the advisory board. In his speech, Stephen Hawking reiterated his belief that humans need to explore space to avoid the dangers of our own finite world. And then he described how humans could one day travel on a beam of light, harnessing the power of Einstein's theory of relativity to reach mind-boggling distant planets. The human imagination has led us to peer ever deeper into the universe with scientific tools, said Hawking. Yet despite this ability to investigate the most distant reaches of the universe without leaving our backyards, humans shouldn't be content with this sedentary approach. Quote, Shouldn't we be content to be cosmic sloths enjoying the universe from the comfort of Earth? The answer is no, end quotes. That's what Stephen Hawking said. He continued, quote, The Earth is under threat from so many areas that it's difficult for me to be positive, end quotes. What's more, humans are naturally curious explorers who are driven to push into the unknown. Stephen Hawking described the looming threats of a too-crowded world facing climate change, the collapse of animal species, and the draining of physical resources. Stephen Hawking has previously mentioned his conviction that humanity is doomed in the next millennium unless people can come up with an escape plan. Quote, when we have reached similar crises in our history, there has usually been somewhere else to colonize. Columbus did that in 1492 when he discovered the New World. But now there is no New World, no utopia around the corner, end quotes, Hawking said. The easiest targets are the places closest to home, the Moon and Mars. And that's what he said in his Stormus address. The Moon is nearby, but it's small. It has no liquid water and lacks a magnetic field to shield people from radiation. Mars may once have had liquid water and an atmosphere, but not any longer. 
But there's an even more promising idea to explore some of the planets in the vicinity of our nearest stellar neighbor, Proxima Centauri. It lies at a distance of about 4.5 light years from Earth, where one light year is nearly 6 trillion miles, or 10 million kilometers. Then there's that planet circling Proxima Centauri called Proxima Centauri b. It might be somewhat similar to Earth, at least in a few respects, according to Stephen Hawking. However, we'll never know how hospitable Proxima b is unless we can get there. At current speeds using chemical propulsion, it would take three million years to reach that exoplanet. Thus, space colonization requires a radical departure in our travel technology. Quote, to go faster would require a much higher exhaust speed than chemical rockets can provide, that of light itself. A powerful beam of light from the rear could drive the spaceship forward. Nuclear fusion could provide 1% of the spaceship's mass energy, which would accelerate it to a tenth of the speed of light, end quotes. Going faster than that would require harnessing matter-antimatter annihilation, or as yet undreamed of technology, he added. When matter and antimatter come into contact, they annihilate, by the way, releasing gobs of energy. To bring these seeming pipe dreams closer to reality, Hawking, along with physicist and billionaire Yuri Milner, has founded a company, Breakthrough Starshot. We've talked about that here on UFO Headline News. They're aiming to make interstellar travel a reality. As an early prototype, the team is creating a teensy space probe just a few centimeters wide. They're going to attach that to a minuscule light sail. The plan to send 1,000 of these star chips and their sails into the void with arrays of lasers uniting to form one powerful light beam that would propel the tiny sails with gigawatts of power, according to Stephen Hawking. The energy imparted to these tiny space probes could zoom them to speeds reaching about 100 million miles per hour. That's 160 million kilometers per hour. That would mean they would reach Mars in a day, as opposed to 260 days using propulsion. At one-fifth the speed of light, the probes would reach Alpha Centauri in just 20 years. They'd send images of any possible planets back on another light beam, according to Hawking. There's another physicist, Claudius Gross. He's proposed using these tiny space explorers to colonize far-flung planets with a biosphere of unicellular organisms. To sum it all up, let's finish with the words of Stephen Hawking, quote, Human colonization on other planets is no longer science fiction. It can be science fact. The human race has existed as a separate species for about two million years. Civilization began about 10,000 years ago, and the rate of development has been steadily increasing. If humanity is to continue for another million years, our future lies in boldly going where no one else has gone before. End quotes. Ah, those words. Those Star Trek source words. A continuing nod to Mr. Gene Roddenberry. Our weekend off the beaten path takes us now to Scotland, to this headline, Loch Ness Monster Spotted? Tourists' photo sparks debate. The source here is foxnews.com tech department, but we're going to read it anyway. It's a fascinating story, and here we go. Is that Nessie? There's a photo of a strange object moving in the waters of Loch Ness. It's sparking yet another debate. There's an Australian tourist named Peter Jackson. Nope, no relation to the filmmaker of the same name. The other person is Philip Wern. They were driving along the loch when they spotted an object in the water and took a picture of this object on their phone. They showed it to a local skipper who said he had, quote, not seen anything like it, end quotes. Here's another quote from witness Philippa Wern. Quote, it was pretty big, even from 150 yards or more offshore. I didn't know what to think. We took photos and showed them to people at a bed and breakfast, and then showed them to people on a cruise, end quote, she said. Wern added this object was, quote, moving fast, but in the direction of the current, end quote, and quipped that if the skipper had not seen anything like that before, then, quote, it must be something, end quote. 
Peter Jackson said the couple was, quote, dumbfounded but excited, end quotes, to see this object. It seems the event took place at 5.18 p.m. local time on June 22nd. The couple was driving north on the west side of Loch Ness. They proceeded to get out of their vehicle and take pictures on their smartphones. This sighting lasted five minutes. That's according to the Register of Loch Ness Monster Sightings. Oh, what a fun read that would be. While not claiming it's the monster itself, Peter said, quote, I know I saw something, and I know it was large, so I'm keeping an open mind, end quotes. The sighting is only the second to make it onto that official register in this year, noted Gary Campbell. He's the registrar of sightings at Loch Ness. Gary Campbell added that this picture, along with other pictures of the loch, is, quote, a little bit indistinct, end quotes, but he added that with the detailed report handed in, quote, there is really no clear explanation as to what this family caught on camera, end quotes. Incidentally, the only other sighting added to the register in 2017 was May 1st, when a dark shape, higher than the waves, was spotted in the loch's Yukwahart Bay. Oh, so many monsters, so little time. Speaking of time, let's go way back to ancient Egypt, shall we? But before we do, we have to briefly touch on the fact that recently it has come to light that Egypt and Scotland, where we just saw perhaps the Loch Ness Monster, have connections, way back connections, DNA connections, but that's an article for another broadcast. So here's this headline, Ancient Egyptian Writing, New Symbols Reveal Development of Hieroglyphics. This gets a byline for Josh Lowe, who writes it for Newsweek. The elegant pictorial writing system of the ancient Egyptians, known as hieroglyphics, has fascinated generations of archaeologists. Its precise origins are uncertain. One ancient Egyptian legend holds that the god Thoth, or Toth, T-H-O-T-H, handed the gift of writing to a few chosen scribes. A more prosaic modern theory suggests they're derived from rock pictures produced by prehistoric hunting societies wandering the desert. Now along comes a new discovery, which might hold some clues as to how carved images evolved into a formal writing system. There's a Facebook post, of all things, by the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities. It's a new rock inscription site discovered around 60 kilometers south of Luxor in the village of El Kawi, that's spelled E-L hyphen K-H-A-W-Y. And this quote helps in understanding the development of a system of graphic communication that sets the stage for the appearance of true hieroglyphic writing, end quotes. It's a rock panel. It displays four signs. It was discovered on a joint Yale and Royal Museums of Art and History expedition out of Brussels. It features depictions of a bull's head on a short pole, followed by two back-to-back saddle-billed storks and a bald ibis bird above and between them. Yale University's John Coleman Darnell said in an article on Yale's website, these constitute, quote, some of the earliest and largest signs from the formative stages of the hieroglyphic script, end quotes. According to the Egyptian Antiquities Ministry, they say, quote, these symbols are not phonetic writing, but appear to provide the intellectual background for moving from depictions of the natural world to hieroglyphs that wrote the sounds of the ancient Egyptian language, end quotes. The inscriptions date back around 5,200 years, with each individual sign being about half a meter in height. Said Darnell, quote, This is the first time that anyone has seen them on such a massive scale, end quotes. He said that the team was absolutely flabbergasted by the size of this discovery. According to Yale, they are significant not only for their unique size, but also because they show that even in its earliest phases, the use of hieroglyphic writing was widespread and not confined to the offices of dusty bureaucrats, as some had previously argued. Here's another quote from Yale University's John Coleman Darnell. Quote, this also suggests that there is a much more expansive use of the early writing system than is indicated from the other surviving archaeological material. End quotes. 
The researchers found the inscriptions in the northern desert landscape of El Cab. Let's spell that E L K A B. This area of El Cab, along with a city called Hierakonpolis, oh, let's spell that H I E R A K O N P O L I S. There's the beginning of the word hieroglyphics, Hierakonpolis, across the river. These were extremely important settlements in ancient Egypt, according to this latest study. Speaking of studies, let's tease you with this broadcast special coming up next weekend for Off the Beaten Path. We're going to be covering the latest find out of Gobekli Tepe. Here's a clue. It involves human skulls. They're very, very old human skulls, but yep, they're human skulls. So be sure and join us next weekend for that. And also we're going to cover some interesting investigations by the Bigfoot Research Organization. Yep, Sasquatch time next weekend. Let's switch now to cats. Well, that's kind of close to ancient Egypt. No, here's a DNA study. The headline, quote, DNA study reveals cats traveled with humans centuries ago. This is from the wires of Associated Press. There isn't any byline here, but as we do, we read it anyway. Long before cats became the darlings of Facebook and YouTube, they spread throughout the ancient human world. A DNA study reached back thousands of years to track that conquest, and found evidence of two major dispersals from the Middle East. Dispersals during which people evidently took their cats with them. And the genetic signatures the felines had on those journeys are still seen in most modern-day breeds. Researchers analyzed DNA from 209 ancient cats as old as 9,000 years, cats from Europe, Africa, and Asia, including some ancient Egyptian cat mummies. Quote, they are direct witnesses of the situation in the past, end quotes. That's from Eva Marie Gagel of the Jacques Monod Institute in Paris. She and colleagues also looked at 28 modern feral cats from Bulgaria and East Africa. It's the latest glimpse into the complicated story of domesticated cats. They are descendants of wild ancestors that learned to live with people and became relatively tame, although some cat owners would say that nowadays they don't always seem enthusiastic about our company. The domestication process might have begun around 10,000 years ago when people settled in the Fertile Crescent, that arch-shaped region that includes the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea and land around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They stored grain, which drew rodents, which in turn attracted wild cats. Animal remains in trash heaps might have attracted them too. Over time, these wild felines adapted to this man-made environment. They got used to hanging around people. Previous studies had found a cat buried alongside a human some 9,500 years ago in Cyprus. That's an island without any native population of felines. That indicates the cat was brought by boat and had some special relationship to that person, researchers say. Cats were clearly tame by about 3,500 years ago in Egypt, where paintings often place them beneath chairs. That shows that by that time, quote, the cat has made its way into the household, end quotes, said Eva Marie Gagel. But the overall domestication process has been harder for scientists to track, in part because fossil skeletons don't reveal whether a cat was wild or domesticated. It's easier to distinguish canines, dogs, our first domesticated animal, from their wolf ancestors. Dogs evolved from wolves that had begun to associate with people even before farming began, perhaps drawn by the food the humans left behind. This latest study tracked the spread of specific cat DNA markers over long distances and through time, a sign that people had taken cats with them. The results were released last Monday by the journal Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. Here's a quote from Carlos Driscoll of the Wildlife Institute of India, quote, The study strengthens and refines previous work. The extensive sampling of cat DNA going back so far in time is unprecedented, end quotes. Researchers were also looking for genetic variants that produce that blotchy coat pattern typical of modern-day domestic cats, rather than those tiger-like stripes seen in their wilder cousins. 
It shows up more often in samples from after the year 1300 than earlier ones, which fits with other evidence that the tabby cat markings became common by the 1700s, and people started breeding cats for their appearance in the 1800s. That's late in the domestication of cats in contrast to horses, which were bred for their appearance early on. Most of the study focused on the ancient dispersal of cats. In the DNA samples analyzed, one genetic signature found first in the Asian portion of Turkey, and perhaps once carried by the fertile crescent cats, showed up more than 6,000 years ago in Bulgaria. That indicates cats had been taken there by boat, with the first farmers colonizing Europe. It also appeared more than 5,000 years ago in Romania, as well as 3,000 years ago in Greece. There's a second genetic signature, first seen in Europe. It reached Europe between the 1st and 5th centuries. It's shown by a sample from Bulgaria. This was found in a 7th century sample from a Viking trading port in northern Europe and an 8th century sample from Iran. So, the dispersal of cats across the Mediterranean was probably encouraged by their usefulness in controlling rodents and other pests on ships. That's what this new research is showing. Oh, cats, if you have one or two, don't they just run the household? Twas ever thus, apparently. Here's something we find fascinating, breatharians. It's not anything really new, and the rational wiki entry, well, it doesn't provide a lot. But there is this practice called breatharianism. It seems to have its roots in antiquity. It's the concept that one can live without food or drink and subsist only off of light, light from the sun. And here's an interesting little twist. According to many practitioners, this light is accurate channeled information from a huge invisible spaceship hovering over North America. Well, hmm. But then again, there are some notable breatharians. The name most commonly associated with breatharianism is a woman from Australia. She calls herself Jaz Muheen, spelled J-A-S-M-U-H-E-E-N. Her born name, Ellen Grieve. She claims to live only on a cup of tea and a biscuit every few days. However, the only supervised test of this claim by the Australian edition of 60 Minutes back in 1999 left her suffering from severe dehydration. They had to halt this trial after four days, despite Ellen Greaves' insistence that she was happy to continue. She claimed the failure was due to being near a city road that led her to being forced to breathe bad air. She continued to say this after she was moved to the middle of nowhere. Apparently, Jaz Mohin found some source of nourishment. In 2000, she won the IG Nobel Prize in Literature for her book, Living on Light. And then, remember Dick Gregory, that wonderful comedian and civil rights activist? He promoted and followed something called the Fruitarian Diet, and promoted but didn't follow the Breatharian Diet. In a still popular 1975 book he wrote, the title, Dick Gregory's Natural Diet for Folks Who Eat, Cooking with Mother Nature. Oh, bring it. The focus of today's article is a husband and wife named Akahi Ricardo and Camila Castello. They believe that food and water aren't necessary to sustain humans and that humans can be solely sustained by the energy of the universe. The couple have a five-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter together. They've survived on little else besides a piece of fruit or vegetable broth just three times per week since 2008. And Costello even practiced something called a breatharian pregnancy, not eating anything during the entire nine months she carried her first child. The couple claims their food-free lifestyle has improved their health and emotional well-being, as well as letting them spend money for traveling rather than weekly groceries. Costello, 34, who lives between California and Ecuador with her husband, explained, quote, Humans can go without food as long as they are connected to the energy that exists in all things and through breathing. For three years, Akahi and I didn't eat anything at all, and now we only eat occasionally, like if we're in a social situation or if I simply want to taste a fruit. 
There's more to this article. You can link to it later at ufoheadlinenews.com. Confession, gentle listeners, this broadcaster is picturing that Kentucky fried chicken zinger sandwich up in the lofty balloon. But we've got to fly because that's a wrap. Hope you've enjoyed Off the Beaten Path, the weekend feature at UFO Headline News. Follow this broadcast at ufoheadlinenews.com. Take care of each other. We're all in this together. This is Carol Carl. See you tomorrow.